Have you ever found yourself falsely accused of a serious crime? If not, count myself fortunate, because I never sought trouble yet somehow found myself drowning in it. My name is Christopher, and my wife Gabriella and I have shared five tumultuous years together. Our paths first crossed a week before Christmas during my senior year of high school. Back then, my primary goal was to charm as many girls as possible. However, Gabriella proved to be a challenge I couldn't overcome. Looking back, I wish I had accepted defeat gracefully. Instead, I persisted in my pursuit throughout the rest of senior year, only to find myself facing a downfall upon graduation. Despite my intention to embark on a bright future promptly, circumstances took a different turn. Soon after a night out together, we discovered Gabriella was pregnant 1.5 months later, forcing us to rethink any honeymoon plans suitable for expectant mothers. My dreams of attending college were indefinitely postponed. Yet, my fascination with computer programming remained unwavering, prompting me to dive into numerous college-level courses. By my later years in high school, I had developed a strong command of SQL, effortlessly constructing queries, views, functions, and stored procedures. Crafting triggers for complex data scenarios became second nature, thanks to the plethora of tools and resources available online. My skills sharpened considerably, and the beauty of it all was the ability to work remotely from anywhere with Wi-Fi, sparing me the need to leave the comfort of my home. However, my current circumstances have become somewhat tangled due to an incident at a nightclub where I found myself involved in a physical altercation. As a result, I'm now under house arrest for the next six months. Despite not being someone inclined towards physical confrontation, this marked my first altercation since grade school and it was more of an ambush than a fair fight. Fortunately, I managed to avoid facing felony charges. Following the birth of our son Henry, Gabriella, and I experienced a peaceful seven months. I held down a decently paying programming job, working in an office alongside a dozen other programmers. Despite our young age of 20 and relative inexperience, in many aspects of life, Gabriella and I indulged in adult activities. Gabriella claimed she faithfully took her birth control pills, yet here we were, staring at a sonogram in the doctor's office, revealing three sets of tiny hands and feet. Things progressed smoothly as Lucas arrived first, followed shortly by Olivia, and finally, Rain completed our family. Now, I'm seriously considering undergoing sterilization before any further expansion of our family. Dealing with a stubborn toddler entering his terrible twos, Feeling neglected compared to his whining sisters has been exhausting. So, one Saturday night, we arranged for Gabriella's parents to babysit while we enjoyed dinner at a franchise restaurant before stumbling upon a nightclub with a live band. It was our inaugural visit to a bar since hitting the legal drinking age of 21. The venue was bustling, making it arduous to engage in conversation or find space on the dance floor. We decided to switch to a different nightclub, sounds of band, but boasting a jukebox and a vibrant dance floor, where approximately 35 revelers were enjoying themselves. After a few dances and drinks, we found ourselves seated near three other couples, all strangers. The men were engrossed in sports discussions, while the women engaged in their own chatter. Soon, a group of men approached our table, extending invitations for the ladies to join them on the dance floor. Two accepted while two declined. I watched as Gabrielle apartment with a man for a couple of spirited dances before returning to our table. Subsequently, another man requested her company on the dance floor. With a glance in my direction and my nod of approval, they danced together to both fast and slow tunes, with no signs of inappropriate behavior apparent. Excusing myself briefly to visit the restroom, upon my return, I discovered Gabriella had vanished. Despite my efforts to locate her, she remained elusive. Stepping outside, my gaze fell upon a man with his right hand positioned intimately between Gabriella's legs, vigorously touching her outside her jeans. She seemed to reciprocate her hands around his neck, while his left hand ventured beneath her blouse, and their faces were in close proximity. Without hesitation, I intervened by delivering a forceful kick to the side of his leg just below the knee, eliciting a cry of pain. Pressing his blunt locks forcefully against the concrete butt building, I caused him to collapse. 
Subsequent kicks thwarted any further misconduct on his part. It seemed my final kick had a significant impact, possibly affecting his reproductive organs. Security intervened shortly after. Turning to Gabriella, I demanded an explanation for her actions. Her response was incoherent, leaving me baffled. How she managed to return home remains a mystery to me. Throughout the night, I pondered what might have led to such inappropriate behavior. Our group found ourselves confined to a holding cell, seven of us in total. After my parents posted bail for me and brought me home, Gabriella repeatedly apologized. However, I eventually confronted her, stating that apologies don't clarify motives. When you're ready to explain, I'll be all ears, but until then, please refrain from speaking. Despite my request, no explanation was ever provided. Sexual intimacy declined as tension persisted in the household. Gabriella made efforts to avoid conflicts, despite our financial constraints limiting us to a novice lawyer. I doubted that splurging on a top-tier attorney would have yielded better results. I was sentenced to seven months under house arrest, confining me to my home except for medical emergencies or transportation by ambulance or police car. My constant presence became overwhelming for Gabriella, who began socializing with neighbors over coffee to cope. However, I found solace in spending time with my family. Thankfully, my boss accommodated my situation, allowing me to participate in online meetings to stay updated on project requirements and progress. The next blow to our marriage came less than a month into my confinement. Christopher, I'll be direct. I can't bear sitting idle every night while you're stuck here. Since that incident, where I was groped, I've been reconsidering my choices. I met someone at the supermarket, I'm going out on a date with him this Friday night. I had intended to remain composed and speak sensibly, but my reaction was quite different. Gabriella, gripped by fear, sought refuge in our bedroom and secured the door. I explicitly conveyed that our marriage would be terminated if she persisted upon her retreat to the bedroom. Promptly, I contacted both sets of parents who agreed to come over. Gabriella's parents, Larry and Alice, and mine share striking similarities. My mother, Evelyn, and Alice both embody a nurturing persona, while Evelyn occasionally opts for trousers. Alice exclusively dons floor-length dresses, concealing any potential extra appendages. My father, Dallas, and Larry bear resemblance too, sporting fashionable beards and receding hairlines. Recounting my understanding of Gabrielle's grievances to the assembled group, despite Alice's efforts to coax her out, the situation escalated beyond control. Amidst heated exchanges, Gabriella abruptly called an end to the evening with a chilling ultimatum. If you ever want to see your grandchildren again, you will stay out of my personal life. Expressions of sympathy from our parents were evident as they bid their farewells with comforting hugs. Gabriella retreated once more to the bedroom, locking the door behind her, leaving me to spend another night on the couch. For the remainder of the week, Gabriella was hardly home, and I was clueless about her whereabouts. I found myself responsible for four affectionate yet needy mouths to feed and attend to. Dias arranged for a visit from a divorce lawyer, leaving me feeling trapped with limited options unless Gabriella was proven unfit as a mother. I faced nearly 18 years of child support, along with expenses for spousal support, housing, and other obligations. On Friday evening, just past seven, came the disrespectful remark from Gabriella. I'm not sure if I'll return tonight. I pleaded with Gabriella one final time not to leave, but despite my pleas, she drove away, signaling the end of our marriage. Around 1.30 a.m., my phone rang from an unrecognized number, so I let it go to voicemail. However, upon hearing the message tone, I decided to listen. Mr. Richardson, this is Abby from University Hospital. Your wife, Gabriella, has been admitted. While she's not in danger, she'll need surgery tomorrow. I wanted to inform you. Part of me felt a sense of justice, but I couldn't leave the house. Did he harm her? Was she in a car accident? Was he behind the wheel? Sleep eluded me as I pondered these questions. The hungry cries of the three little ones only added to my exhaustion, and I was drained by the time the roosters announced dawn at 7.20 a.m. Interrupting my thoughts, the doorbell rang. Approaching the front door, 
I noticed the sleek sedan parked behind my car. The man standing at the door displayed his badge and asked, Is Christopher Richardson here? That would be me. How can I assist you? Detective Logan, isn't it? Yes, Cordy Logan. Are you aware that your wife is in hospital? I am. Is that all you have for me? No. Where were you around midnight last night? Bothered to check, you'd already have the answer. I replied, gesturing toward my ankle monitor. Oh, my apologies. I should have done some research. Do you know anyone who might wish harm upon your wife? No one immediately comes to mind. The hospital left a message about her being there. That's all I know of what happened. I must say, Christopher, your demeanor is rather perplexing. Care to elaborate? Last night, she made the decision to end our marriage and went on a date. Part of me couldn't help but wish her companion had severely assaulted her. His expression turned grave. Nothing of that sort. At least not as far as I know. She was physically attacked as she was leaving a motel room. There's no indication of sexual assault. Her face is badly bruised, but the most severe damage is to her left hand. Each finger was broken with a hammer. They left a message on her face with a black marker. Choices have consequences. Despite the grim news, I found myself smiling. I had no involvement whatsoever in this. I can't help you, Logan. If you'll excuse me, I hear children who need feeding. Again, I considered reaching out to Gabriella's parents to inform them of what I knew. But ultimately, I decided Gabriella should handle that conversation herself. The day was filled with the usual chaos of caring for the children, feeding, bathing, changing diapers, and repeat. I barely had time to spare for 15 minutes of television, and my programming projects were piling up, indicating another late night of coding ahead. Just past 5 p.m., my phone rang, displaying Gabriella's name on the caller ID. I chose to let it go to voicemail. Christopher, I don't know if you're aware, but I was assaulted last night. Today, they performed surgery on my left hand. All my fingers and thumb are broken, and my entire hand is in a cast. Could you arrange for someone to drop off a change of clothes for when I come home tomorrow? How are my babies? Please give me a call. It's as if I'm her damn caretaker. Screw you. Put on your provocative outfit and go home during dinner. My favorite detective showed up at my doorstep. Mr. Richardson, I have a search warrant for your residence, Logan stated. No need to be so formal. Please come in. Would you like something to drink? I offered. No, thank you. I remained silent as they seized my computers and engaged in a thorough search. Logan's assistants exchanged looks, indicating they found nothing. Logan, what's happening? I inquired. There's been a related assault. It appears to be a case of sexual retaliation. We've connected this individual to your wife. His genitals were mutilated with the same message written on his face. In black marker. I winced. Mutilated. That must be painful. Similar to Gabriella's assault. I had no involvement in this whatsoever. Well, it seems like karma's caught up with him. Best of luck with your investigation. Oh, and since you're confiscating my phone, could you please call my dad for me? Logan dialed Dallas's number. I asked him if he could lend me a laptop and get me a cheap disposable phone. My parents arrived with dinner, and I briefed them on what I knew. My mom voiced what I was already thinking. She deserves it. Gabriella continued to send additional messages, portraying herself as the victim of a random incident, rather than expressing any remorse for her decision to end the marriage. I chose to ignore her voicemails and texts on Sunday. Around noon, she was dropped off at our house by a car. The children were thrilled to see her, but I made an effort to stay in other parts of the house for the rest of the day. Despite her struggles with the children, I ignored her requests for assistance. If you're unable to handle something, then retreat to the bedroom, and I'll take care of it, Christopher. Please, don't act this way. We're still married. I'll be in this cast for at least 10 weeks. I need your cooperation. I disregarded her and entered my office space with headphones on, blocking out my surroundings with music. I managed to accomplish some work. I caught the scent of dinner cooking and sensed a tap on my shoulder. 
Gabriella passed me a note. The kids need baths. I can't risk getting my cast wet. I'll be in the bedroom. When Logan returned my computers and phone, he informed me that my browser history and cell phone activity were of no use to them. It was satisfying to be able to say, I told you so. Gabriella inquired to Logan about the recovery of her rings. She had been wearing my wedding band, along with her maternal grandmother's wedding band. Apparently, the attackers removed them before injuring her fingers. Logan replied that no rings had been found or turned in. We existed in a stalemate. Gabriella would attempt to exert influence, and I would stand firm until the bedroom door closed. She made daily attempts to sway my determination, but I remained resolute. On a Thursday, Gabriella emerged from the bedroom in seductive attire while I was on the phone with Alice. She informed me, I have plans for another date, unsure if I'll return tonight. I gazed at her in shock. It became clear I needed a divorce. Promptly, I refused to endure being cuckolded, though I would miss my children. I felt I had reached my breaking point. Alice agreed to take the kids to their doctor's appointment on Friday and expressed her dismay regarding Gabriella's actions. While she offered moral support, I was too overwhelmed to think rationally. Fortunately, the comforting presence of my children offered a glimmer of hope for the future. I was in a deep sleep when my phone suddenly rang. Seeing an unfamiliar number, I allowed it to go to voicemail. Later, upon hearing the notification turn, I listened to the message. Mr. Richardson, this is Scarlett from University Hospital. Your wife, Gabriella, has been admitted. I'm reaching out as a courtesy. You can reach me at. What in the world? Was this a repeat of our first encounter? I doubted she was with the same person. Injuries like those don't heal so quickly. Perhaps this person had assaulted her. It was disturbing to realize that part of me wished for her to suffer similar injuries. Twisted, I know, but my life is in chaos right now. After taking a sip of whiskey and drifting into sleep, my concern for Gabriella vanished with a mug of coffee in hand. I welcomed Logan as he approached the front door. Logan, good to see you again. What's the latest? Here's your copy of the search warrant. Same pattern. Assaulted, leaving the motel, broken fingers, and another message on her face. Another victim with mutilated privates. You're elusive, but we're determined to apprehend you. Give it your best shot, Logan, but I'm just as clueless as you are. Same message on the man. Yes, on Gabriella, a second message. You're a slow learner. Feet are next. You mentioned broken fingers, right hand this time. That's correct. She'll be incapacitated for quite some time. Unfortunate for her. Don't expect me to come to her aid before they confiscated my phones. I phoned my dad to request borrowing his laptop once more. Additionally, I mentioned needing another disposable phone. Fortunately, all my work is stored in the cloud. I had the foresight to create backups of everything, transfer them onto thumb drives, and entrust them to my dad for safekeeping. On Friday, around 5 o'clock p.m., I received a call from Gabriella. Well, not exactly Gabriella herself, but someone calling on her behalf. She sounded distressed, fretting about how she would manage this. And yet, she kept on complaining, oblivious to the fact that I couldn't care less. Perhaps her parents will provide her with shelter. During dinner, Evelyn stopped by and assisted with looking after the children. When my phone rang, she noticed it was Gabriella and answered, activating the speakerphone. Christopher, you need to assist me, Gabriella pleaded. This is Evelyn. Don't expect Christopher or any of his acquaintances to ace someone like you, Evelyn. I've told you to refrain from meddling in my personal affairs, I interjected. She offered me the phone, but I declined. So she ended the call. On Sunday, Gabriella attempted to contact me again. I let it go to voicemail. Christopher, if I return home, Will you support me? Please call. I didn't call back. I have no knowledge of her whereabouts. Lotham returned my electronics a few days earlier than before, with the same warning that they still suspect my involvement. Monday morning, I was surprised by an unexpected visitor, Alice. 
What brings you here? I asked. I'm here to assist you with the children. What about Gabriella? I inquired. Isn't she staying with you? No, she asked us to mind our own business. So we've stopped answering her calls. We haven't seen her since that night. She instructed us to stay out of her life. She's staying with one of her friends, possibly someone from her wedding party. They've called on Gabriella's behalf several times, but we've informed them that we no longer consider her our daughter. In that case, please come in. Would you like some coffee? I offered. Black, please. Where are my babies? Alice stayed out of my way and spent the entire day looking after the children. When they were asleep, I handled the rest. She took care of the laundry and did some general cleaning initially. I thought it was just for one day, but she has returned every day since, some days Zari joins her. I managed to catch up on my work projects and even had time for a guilt-free nap. I haven't received any communication from Gabriella, and Alice confirms she hasn't either. My attorney suggested it was an opportune moment to initiate divorce proceedings, considering that Gabriella has effectively abandoned the children. With Alice staying for dinner, I can structure my day as if I were still married. The previously chaotic days have now settled into a tranquil rhythm. However, this newfound calmness allows ample time for me to contemplate my situation with Gabriella and nurture my resentment. My mother visits several times a week too. The grandparents have a much better relationship than Gabriella and I ever did. When the kids have a medical appointment, one of the grandparents usually takes them. Once the paperwork was prepared, Gabriella was served. Her voicemails were filled with explicit language and threats. I chose not to delete them, thinking they might offer the court a clearer understanding of Gabriella's behavior. Given my limited mobility, the lawyer's meetings took place in my front yard. I hoped this would bring an added layer of shame for Gabriella. They were determined to argue for Gabriella's custody rights and to secure child support from me. We made similar claims against Gabriella, asserting that she needed to find employment to contribute to child support. Given her skill set, it seemed unlikely she could manage this without resorting to earnings from escort services. The initial court hearing didn't go well for Gabriella. My lawyer portrayed me as a sole provider for the children over the past eight weeks. They countered this by stating that, due to her injuries, Gabriella couldn't use her hands. When questioned why I wasn't assisting her, my attorney presented depositions from Gabriella's two lovers with injured genitalia. I affirmed that I didn't approve of Gabriella engaging in extramarital affairs. Gabriella and her legal team huddled for several minutes. That final move was presenting a piece of paper containing a cautionary message to Gabriella. My lawyer contended that the note could have been fabricated solely for dramatic effect. Gabriella's lawyers lacked evidence regarding the origin of the note. I was not involved in its creation. Now we await further proceedings. The court requested additional documentation from Gabriella regarding her abandonment of the children. According to my attorney, this development bodes well for our case. After the cast on her left hand was removed, Gabriella entered the house. She found all her belongings crammed into the laundry room, which infuriated her. My lawyer advised me to let her back in, as not doing so would create a negative impression. Despite my hope that the children would reject Gabriella, they didn't. While holding Olivia, she attempted a different approach. Christopher, what do I need to do to move past this? I still love you. And I believe you love me too. I'm sorry for hurting you. I was immature, but I've grown a lot in the past three months. Gabriella, you're mistaken. I no longer love you. The sooner I can remove you from my life, the better. I'm not leaving. You'll still have to deal with me. As frustration grew during my visits with the children, I headed to my office. Our upcoming court date loomed nearer. Gabriella was asleep on the couch and we continued to avoid each other almost constantly, similar to before. When she had only one functional hand, I took care of matters. Once Gabriella was confined to a room, when our case was called, Gabriella appeared pleased to see her parents present, although she hadn't seen them. Since the argument preceding her first court appearance, she waved at them, but they ignored her. Her demeanor shifted when my attorney summoned Alice to the stand. Alice. May I address you as such? Yes. 
Gabriella is your daughter, was we disown her. Now, why is it that she is promiscuous and entirely unfit to raise my grandchildren? Christopher is more than capable of caring for them. While Gabriella was incapacitated, she engaged in promiscuous behavior. Christopher was at home, looking after the children. She's abandoned them. I won't allow my precious angels to grow up thinking that promiscuity is an acceptable lifestyle choice. Isn't it true that Christopher is currently under house arrest? Yes, but that's because he assaulted someone he believed was harming Gabriella. Turns out she was engaging in promiscuous behavior that night too. No further questions, Your Honor. Gabriella's attorney wisely chose not to cross-examine. Celebratory high fives ensued when I was granted custody and Gabriella was mandated to provide child support. Alimony wasn't necessary as I was covering all housing expenses. When my lawyer presented the recorded threatening voicemails, the judge ruled that the initial three months of visitation must be supervised. I had anticipated feeling elated as a liberated man, but instead it was a mix of melancholy and a touch of relief. Not much changed. Back at the house, Alice visited every day, and she and Evelyn took charge of my romantic life. I made it clear that finding a romantic partner wasn't a priority. That was until one Saturday morning, when Sophie showed up at my doorstep. Alice had invited her over to help with the kids. Sophia had a son, just a week older than Henry. Her husband had died in a car accident when she was five months pregnant. She was 1.5 years older than me, and worked in customer support for an insurance agency. It was clear to everyone that this was a setup, but I didn't object while the kids slept. Sophia and I sat at the kitchen table and talked. I shared the story of my house arrest, and she told me about her late husband. Just as I was about to tell her about Gabriella, there was a knock on the front door. Gabriella, good to see you. The kids are asleep now. I assume the lady with you is overseeing today. Yes, this is Evelyn Thompson. I greeted Evelyn with a handshake before checking her credentials. Alice waved goodbye as she exited through the back door. I welcomed Evelyn and Gabriella. Inside Gabriella, this is Sophia, a dear friend of mine. Her son, Chad, is asleep with Henry. Gabriella's gaze towards Sophia could have caused damage if it were possible. Sophia, however, maintained a wide smile and greeted Gabriella softly. Nice to meet you. Gabriella roused the children while I escorted Sophia to the door. Would you like me to bring dinner tonight? After all, we're close friends. Without hesitation, I leaned in for a kiss, which was reciprocated. I'd love that. See you tonight. Gabriella observed closely as I interacted with Sophia. Everyone watched as Sophia waved from her car while driving off. Four hours later, as Gabriella and Evelyn departed at the end of their scheduled visit, I found myself excited at the thought of having dinner with a woman for the first time in six months. After feeding the kids and putting them down for a nap, I took a quick shower, shaved, and applied a touch of aftershave. I selected a nice shirt and clean pair of jeans. While I was changing, the doorbell rang. Sophia had changed clothes, and with her assistance, we tended to the children. While the boys played, the casserole she brought was enough to last me for several days. We conversed until nearly midnight, which I truly appreciated. Sophia wasn't merely a passive listener. She encouraged me to delve into the thoughts and emotions surrounding Gabrielle's mistreatment of me. Convincing her of my innocence regarding the assaults required all my powers of persuasion. I'm unsure she truly believes me, but it's the truth. Close to midnight, she hugged a drowsy Chad and departed. I requested to meet her again, and she agreed. Our goodnight kiss held much more passion than the earlier peck I had previously thought. I didn't require female companionship, but I spent the entire night tossing and turning, reconsidering. Alice arrived early on Sunday, eager to hear about how things had gone with Gabriella. However, she quickly shifted the conversation to discuss Sophia. I remain reserved about my feelings at this point. I doubted any woman would be interested in a young father with four mouths to feed and care for, though I might be mistaken about that. Sophia brings over a casserole every Saturday. With two more months of house arrest, 
my entertainment options are limited to television or music. When Sophia requested music, she pulled me up to dance. I struggled to prevent my arousal from showing. Unfortunately, she succeeded in provoking a reaction. Christopher, I'm not prepared to dive into another relationship, but it's empowering to know I still captivate you. Can you handle taking things slow? Sophia, I believe so, but my thoughts are jumbled. I'm unsure of what I want. Does that make sense completely? I can't fathom what you've been through, and I'm equally certain you can't understand my experiences. It will take time. Alice had entrusted me with looking after the kids during weekends. On Tuesday, she asked me to take a seat. Christopher, I don't want to control your life. Well, maybe a bit. I had a chat with Sophia's mom. Last night, they reside on the East Coast. She mentioned that Sophia's car had broken down and she couldn't afford repairs with rent and childcare expenses. She barely had a few hundred bucks left each month. Do you think we could take care of Chad and save her? The childcare costs for Henry and Chad seem to get along. Well, Mom, I believe it would be a thoughtful gesture from us, but I'd still need your assistance. How much does she need for the car repairs? I feel like I owe her for the casseroles she's been bringing over. Thank you, Christopher. I'll find out about the car. The following morning, Sophia arrived at my doorstep with a lady in the driver's seat, waving at me. Sophia's eyes sparkled with gratitude. Thank you, Christopher. This means a lot. Sure thing, Sophia. Looking forward to seeing you later today. The bill to repair Sophia's car amounted to $570, but I saw it as a valuable investment. Having the opportunity to spend time with Sophia every day was an unexpected bonus. Our greetings and farewells now carried a newfound passion, with hugs that lingered a little longer each time. With my house arrest behind me, I took advantage of the freedom to embark on a five-mile jog around the neighborhood. During a casual conversation, I floated an idea to Sophia. Would it be possible for you to take Friday off? I'm considering planning a full-day date for us. Alice can take care of the kids. After checking her schedule, she suggested this weekend instead, as both Alice and Evelyn had prior commitments. That sounds wonderful. I'll give you a call later today from the office. A few hours later, our date was set, and my heart raced with excitement. Friday couldn't have gone any smoother. I picked up Sophia and Chad early, dropping Chad off at my place where Alice was looking after him. Then we headed to the marina. The 3.5 hour guided tour provided us with some much needed intimate moments. And with the amusement park now open, the day was filled with excitement. For the next four hours, we explored one topic after another. Eventually, it was time to head back. Christopher, I'm tired of waiting for you to take the initiative. Can I stay over tonight? Hmm, let me think. How about staying for the weekend? The kiss confirmed that it was a yes. Once the kids were asleep, I pondered my next move, wanting to balance between eagerness and restraint. I made us drinks and then suggested, shall we watch some TV in the bedroom? I sensed Sophia was wrestling with the same thoughts. We barely lasted a minute on the bed before getting swept up in a passionate kiss. Our actions felt instinctual. I gently caressed her breast through her clothes, eliciting a soft gasp from Sophia, while she eagerly fumbled with my zipper. As our mutual desires became evident, our clothing disappeared in a hurry. The soft glow of the television illuminated our toned bodies, revealing every curve and contour. Sophia's fingers traced along my chest, a touch noting my slender frame, a stark contrast to a traditional macho image. Despite this, our passion only intensified as we explored each other's bodies with our tongues, building towards a climax. Sophia expertly brought me to completion with her hands, and in turn, I used my fingers to guide her to her own peak of pleasure. It was a mutual recognition that we both had room to refine our skills in the future. I'm still on birth control. Are you confident you're free of any diseases? Sophia asked. I got tested when everything started, and all results were negative. So, yes, I believe so. I've never been tested, so you'll have to trust that I'm clean too, she replied, ready to take it all the way. Yes, I affirmed. 
I was more than ready. Saturday turned out to be the best day I'd had in a year. We shared a tender night together, making love while the kids were asleep. Due to a shortage of car seats, we settled for delivery from an Italian restaurant. Our night took an intimate turn as we both endeavoured to improve our oral skills. Although I didn't climax in her mouth, Sophia's efforts were successful. It was evident that my oral skills needed the most work. Despite Sophia's intense arousal, I only managed to elicit a few tremors during our intimate moments. As we prepared lunch for the children, Sophia's phone rang. It was her mother calling. She answered the call in the living room, away from the bustling kitchen. When she returned, her complexion was pale. I need to go to my mom. My father had a heart attack and is on life support. Can you gather chance things? I'll arrange the travel. In such a situation, there are no words that can truly suffice. I expressed my deepest condolences and assured her of my unwavering support. Shedding tears together, I felt her pain as deeply as my own. As she rushed to the airport within 75 minutes, uncertainty lingered in my mind. Our relationship, while intimate, had been casual, friends with benefits. But could there be more to it? A couple of nights and a day of intimacy don't necessarily imply anything deeper yet. Despite this, I couldn't deny that my feelings for Sophia transcended mere friendship. Did she feel the same way, or was I merely hoping she did? We needed to have a conversation, but with Sophia's father fighting for his life, now wasn't the right time to discuss the complexities of our relationship. Sophia's father managed to survive, albeit in a significantly compromised state. The brain damage resulting from oxygen deprivation left him unable to care for himself or communicate effectively. With Sophia preoccupied by her family's situation, our communication became sparse. We exchanged messages, but it became apparent that our connection had faded. Alice and Evelyn, noticing my melancholy, resumed their matchmaking efforts with renewed vigor. The dates I went on were more traditional, and I made sure to mention my four young children up front, anticipating any potential complications. Closure with Sophia arrived unexpectedly in the form of a heartfelt two-page letter. Her father had passed away, and she had decided to stay on the East Coast. In her letter, she expressed her fond memories of our time together and wished me well in finding someone new. Although her decision stung, I understood and respected it. I trained it in my Sedan for an SUV to accommodate four car seats and another adult, symbolizing my commitment to caring for my children and embracing the future. Supermarket cashiers kindly watched out for me, ensuring that I didn't mistakenly purchase items unsuitable for my quartet. Despite the challenges, I remain hopeful that love will find me again. The thought of anything else is simply too disheartening. A year after Sophia's departure, Alice approached me with news from Sophia's mom, unsure of how I would react. How are they? She asked tentatively, perhaps hoping she hadn't inadvertently reopened old wounds. I couldn't help but smile at the mention of Sophia's mom, as I had always felt a fondness for her. Christopher, you know who I mean if you're asking if I'd welcome her back without hesitation. Sophia's voice echoed in my mind. Three days later, my heart skipped a beat when I arrived home from work to find Sophia waiting for me. Chad and Henry were getting along fine share in a room, just as Sophia and I were adjusting to living together with the help of all the grandparents. Together, we successfully raised five wonderful children. While Sophia and I strive to manage on our incomes alone, the grandparents tend to spoil the kids with purchases that sometimes exceed our budget. Meanwhile, Gabriella remarried about a year after our divorce was finalized. Though she still visits occasionally, she's fallen significantly behind on her child support payments. To our children, she's become more like a sporadic visitor than a mother figure, with Nana Alice assuming the role of their primary maternal figure. Sophia and I decided on a simple courthouse wedding, with neither of us desiring more children. Five is plenty for us. Despite the turmoil of the past, no charges were ever brought against anyone for the assaults on Gabriella or her partners. While Gabriella and her parents remain estranged, I continue to regard Alice and Larry as the loving grandparents they've always been. Several years passed, and our blended family thrived in the warmth of Sophia's and my love. 
Our children grew into bright, compassionate individuals, each with their unique personalities and aspirations. Chad and Henry shared a special bond, much like brothers, while the younger ones looked up to them with admiration. Sophia and I found fulfillment in our respective careers, balancing work with family life seamlessly. Despite the occasional challenges, our commitment to each other and our children remained unwavering. One day, as I was flipping through old photo albums with Sophia, reminiscing about the journey we'd been on together, a sense of nostalgia washed over me. It was then that I realized how far we'd come and how much we'd overcome as a family. With a smile, I turned to Sophia and whispered, Thank you for being by my side through it all. And as our eyes met, I knew that our love story was far from over, filled with countless more chapters of joy, laughter, and shared dreams. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts about this story in the comments below the video.